This podcast is brought to you by Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation. Our mission is to accelerate breakthroughs in life-saving research and empower people everywhere to conquer cancer. Welcome to Your Stories, a podcast where we hear candid stories from people conquering cancer. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Lewis. It's a disease that predates the practice of medicine, one that may very well predate Homo sapiens entirely, cancer. In 2016, archaeologists in South Africa unearthed a large 1.7 million-year-old bone fragment, ultimately revealed to be the toe bone of an ancient but unknown species of pre-human dating back many, many millennia before the first known Homo sapiens. On that piece of bone, they discovered something else, a malignant tumor. It's a stark reminder that for as long as the profession has existed, Physician scientists have been studying and treating cancer. And for better or worse, it brings to mind a question that oncologists have been fielding for decades. After so many centuries of studying cancer, why haven't we cured it yet? The answer, it's complicated. Here to help us better understand what makes cancer such a complex and persistent adversary is Dr. Otis Brawley. In addition to being a professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins, and a former chief medical and scientific officer of the American Cancer Society, Dr. Brawley is a member of Conquer Cancer's board of directors and editor of the Cancer History Project, a free online resource dedicated to documenting the history of cancer in medicine, including the people who shaped our study and understanding of it. Welcome, Dr. Brawley. I believe you go by Otis. It's such an honor to have you with us today, sir. Thank you for having me, and please do call me Otis. Wonderful. And where are you joining us from today, Otis? I'm in Baltimore. Excellent. Where you do a lot of your important work. So if you don't mind, Otis, we'll jump right in. I I know this is such a broad topic, but again, someone with your perspective, I think, can really allow us to to delve in. So I'm just going to start with uh, a few questions, if you don't mind. When it comes to fundraising for cancer research in particular, the word cure is almost inescapable. We have people who run races for the cure. They walk for the cure. And of course, it's 2024. So people even play pickleball for the cure now. But it's also inescapable that after all these centuries, cancer persists around the world. As oncologists, we understand the reason why, but how do you respond when someone, say a patient or a family member asks, why hasn't cancer been conquered? Why hasn't cancer been cured yet? The first thing I do is I explain that cancer is at least 200 different types of diseases. And even within those types of diseases, there are certain subtypes. For example, in non-small cell lung cancer, we've learned through genetic markers and so forth, it's 80 to 100 different types of non-small cell lung cancer. Now, that's something we just learned in the last 40 years through research. The answer is also, of those 200 different types of cancer out there, Some are very treatable. Some are actually, and I will use the word curable. I don't like to use the word cure, by the way. I used to joke it's a four-letter word. But there are people who go into prolonged, complete remissions that last the rest of their life. To a layman, that is cure. And that's true in some leukemias, some lymphomas some early detected solid tumors like in breast cancer or prostate cancer, colon cancer. But the answer to the question is we are still defining what this disease is. It is so complicated. The example of learning that there's not just one type of non-small cell lung cancer. Now, as we learn more about these diseases, we're finding out things that go on inside the cell, and we're figuring out drugs that can interfere with those things that are going on inside the cell. And the end result is, in lung cancer, we do have a few people who have very prolonged, complete remissions, even though they have widely spread, disseminated disease. I personally know of uh, patients who were diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer 18, 19 years ago. And through the miracle of ERISA, Tarsiva, and some other drugs are still alive and still functional with metastatic disease. So 
while I also don't like cure, I think we need to start moving our expectations over to another something, and that is the diabetes or HIV analogy. There are many people who are totally asymptomatic and living wonderful, enjoyable, productive lives with diabetes being treated long-term or with HIV being treated long-term and uh, the disease is not bothering them. I think, well, I know there are more and more people who are falling into that category with their cancers, breast cancer, getting Herceptin and the HER2 blockers, some of the immunotherapies with bladder and lung cancer, some of the lymphomas. We've had people living in peaceful coexistence with their lymphoma for over 50 years now. That's so well said. And, and many of the parts of your answer, Otis, resonated with me. When I hear people use the phrase cure for cancer, it sort of tells me almost implicitly that they're thinking about it as like this monolithic foe. But if I'm going to keep with the uh, mythologic illusion, I think of it as a many, many headed hydra. And rather than lumping and homogenizing this into one big disease, I, like you, see it being split into many, many more diseases. And I'm reminded when I was doing my oncology training in fellowship, I was allotted two weeks to study sarcoma. And the first day my attending sat me down and said, yeah, you know where I'm going with this. He's like, Mark, I'm not going to be able to teach you all the types of sarcoma in this amount of time. Why don't you just you know, focus on how we come up with the diagnosis and how we craft the treatment plan. And I think that sort of individualized medicine, that paradigm really fits more of the sort of, again, splitting that you, know, that you and I are talking about. Yes. The other thing that you've mentioned, which I think is important for our listeners to know, is yes, oncologists are often the most tentative to use the word cure. And I can only explain my own logic, but I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. As you said yourself, some of our milestones in time can be proven to be a bit arbitrary. So you may see someone's cured after five years, but what if the unfortunate relapse in the 61st month? So I, I think you're right. I think durable remission, while uh, not as pithy as perhaps <laughs> often the, the better phrasing, you know, which actually leads me to my next question. And you've already answered this in part, but, you know, much of the conversation around curing cancer seems to, in some way, confuse the meaning of that word with that of eradicating the disease entirely. So for instance, when you think about medical history, especially with infectious disease, you can argue that we have successfully eradicated smallpox. And so I think maybe the sort of misunderstanding of cancer as, as something we can eradicate, like an infectious pathogen, may also explain sort of the misunderstanding. But you know, maybe if you can elaborate on the chronic illness paradigm, how do you set reasonable expectations here? Yeah, I'm very fortunate that I'm trained as both a medical oncologist and an epidemiologist, and I have an appreciation of history, of medical history. You know, in 1900, and there were good records taken in a number of states back then, the cancer death rate was 60 deaths for every 100,000 people. In the year 1991 was the peak year for deaths from cancer in the United States. And that was 215 per 100,000. And I use these two points for two reasons. Number one, something happened throughout the 20th century that caused us to go from 60 to 215. And if we could figure out what happened and take it out, we could prevent a large number of cancers. And number two, there's always going to be a certain amount of cancer. It can be, I happen to think it can be a third or more of what we're seeing now, but there's always going to be a certain amount of cancer. Yeah, I think that's so well said. And, you know, I'm reminded of the, the Edgar uh, Allan Poe story, The Mask of the Red Death, where these aristocrats essentially sequester themselves and they're trying to escape the sort of figure that's, I think, embodying the plague. And it almost strikes me as a really, a, and I'm using this story on purpose, almost an inescapable part of our makeup. And you can argue that it's really a, an evolutionary success that uh, puts our health, unfortunately, in great, in great danger. And I'm going to keep harping on the word cure, because again, I think it's important that we do that. You know, some cancers, as you already mentioned, actually have relatively successful cures or considered more curable than other cancers. So for example, another 
Concord Cancer board member, Dr. Lawrence or Larry Einhorn, really was a pioneering in finding curative therapy for testicular cancer with a remarkably high and durable success rate. Meanwhile, there are other forms of cancer that remain largely incurable. And I'm a GI oncologist. I'm thinking about, for instance, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So why do you think, Otis, that researchers have been able to find promising treatments and even cures for some cancers, and yet others have been tougher nuts to crack? Yeah. And by the way, Larry Einhorn is a personal friend of mine. It's uh, one of the uh, wonderful things about oncology is it's filled with a whole bunch of nice people who want to mentor and help other folks out. There are certain things within that some of the things that make the various cancers different make some of them more susceptible to our old, very toxic chemotherapies and testicular cancer is one of those. Some of the ovarian cancers fall in that category. Some of the leukemias and lymphomas fall into that category. Then there are certain types of cancer that have a lot of things going on inside of them that make them resistant to our current therapies. Pancreatic cancer very frequently has a little molecular pump on the surface of the cell that actually pumps some of our chemotherapies out. You know, so if our chemotherapy gets into the cell, that pump can pump it out and save the cell from being destroyed. Some of our tumors express antigens on their surface such that our immunotherapies can actually encourage our immune system, our white cells, to attack them, whereas other cancers don't have those signs that say, I shouldn't be here. (laughs) And so this is all part of research is understanding the differences amongst these diseases. Since Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act in 1971, and we put a lot of money into basic research in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we have become much better at understanding what's going on inside these cancerous cells. Indeed, there's the argument that we transformed or reformed or redefined what cancer is. Cancer to Larry Einhorn when he was going to medical school in the 1960s is a very different biology from cancer to Larry Einhorn, the distinguished professor at Indiana University today. Yes, exactly. And and even, you know, real thought leaders like Weinberg and Hanrahan, they've even refined what they consider to be the hallmarks of cancer as our understanding has increased. Well, well, let me just point out, Bob Weinberg published a, a sentinel paper about 40 years ago called The Hallmarks of Cancer. He just published the fourth edition of that. Yes, exactly. Okay. Cancer has changed. It is. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I actually just had a medical student follow me yesterday and I showed them all these sort of iterations of that hallmarks of cancer paper. And it just, it's getting more complicated, not simpler. You're yes. actually right about that. When you mentioned immunotherapy, I, I just want to touch on that for a second, because I think in a sort of our climate of direct to consumer advertising, where patients are literally seeing ads on TV that say, well, ask your doctor if, say, Truda is right for you. It, it almost strikes me sometimes as a case of the haves and the have-nots, where we know that some patients and some tumor types are extremely good candidates for treatment with immunotherapy, and others, and again, I'll use the pancreas as an example, traditionally, or at least to date, been very poor candidates. And so I think it's hard sometimes for people to hear about new treatments and then realize that they are not eligible. I think that's really difficult. That's absolutely correct. Unfortunately, many of us, even many of us in medicine, think of cancer as being that one entity or think of cancer as being maybe one or two entities, not several hundred entities. And and it's unfortunate that our, our progress has happened in certain diseases, but not in others. Exactly right. And, and even as we learn about certain diseases, for example, we're starting to learn that there's a group of localized prostate cancers and localized breast cancers that are not genomically programmed to grow, spread, and kill. And uh, one, of the, one of the debates or one of the problems in prostate and breast screening is we are now curing some people who, yes, they have cancer, 
but they don't need to be cured. Yes. Yes. And, you know, one of the most exciting things that I know about in cancer right now are some of the genomic. And by the way, in 1971, we knew what genes were. They had been discovered about 10, 15 years earlier, you know, the double helix and everything. But genomics was not a word in 1971. Right. Some of the genomic tests that we have now are allowing us to say, Mr. Johnson, you have prostate cancer, but this prostate cancer appears to be one of the good ones. Yes. It's not going to bother you for the next 50 years. And Mr. Johnson, you're 70 years old. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Mr. Jones, you got one of the bad ones. If we let this thing go for another five or six years, the horse is going to be out of the barn and it's going to kill you. Yes. So, Mr. Jones, we need to treat you. Mr. Johnson, we need to watch you to make sure that we're correct. And what that also means is before we realized this 15, 20 years ago, some of our treatments look a lot better. You know, your treatment looks really good when you cure somebody who doesn't need to be cured. <laughs> Yes, that's right. This is some of the wisdom. Now, unfortunately, some people will listen to this and say, oh, those doctors don't know what they're doing. And the truth is, we are learning as we go, but some of the wisdom is to learn as we go and make sure that in the future, as many people benefit as possible and as few people get cured unnecessarily. I'll use the word cure in that instance. Yeah, it's interesting, even from my perspective, and certainly I suspect from yours and with your understanding of history, like it's an odd time to live in, Otis, where I know that when they write the history books about this era of medicine, oncologists today are going to be accused of gross overtreatment, indiscriminate toxicity, and, and some of our methods are going to look so crude in the future, and yet we're doing the best we can in the moment. On the other hand, like you were saying, it really challenges conventional wisdom to tell a patient like you're hypothetical, Mr. Johnson, you're going to die with cancer, not of cancer, right? Yes. It just really, I think, goes against the grain. And again, when you tell a patient they have cancer, that's a, that's a tough bell to unring, you know? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll never forget this. And they send people to me because I spend time talking to patients. I can remember this one, Mr. Johnson, who said, I'm an American. You can't tell me I have cancer and we're going to watch it. <laughs> You got to take action. That's right. <laughs> Talk about DNA. It's in the it's in the national uh, sort of identity there, you know? Yeah, well, fortunately, you know, one of the things we have to deal with is uh, health promotion, health education messages over the last 100 years. Yes. Have been find cancer early and cut it out. And now we're coming back with, well, we figured out there's some cancer that doesn't need to be cut out. So we're changing the rules midstream for a lot of people ever since they're on their mother's knee have been told all cancer is bad, find it early, yeah. put it in. But that's part of the evolution of learning. Yes. And as we learn more and more, we need to be willing to change what we've been doing. And you know, our perspective of what the disease is has changed because research over the last 50 years has given us a different view of cancer. We're actually able to look, this is like being able to look at the earth from way out in outer space instead of from six feet above the ground. That's exactly right. And, and it's also why, you know, science trumps dogma, right? If, right? if we just, I say often, and again, my fellowship ended in 2012, if I practiced the way I was trained, it would now be malpractice. That's how much things have evolved. Oh, you're so young. You're so young. <laughs> Let me tell you, I went to a Jesuit school, and some people will say I was scarred by it. Father Polakowski, who would be thrilled that you're quoting the English literature, used to always say, there are things you know, things you don't know, and things you believe. When he heard I was going to medical school, he called me up and said, remember to always label things that you know, things you don't know, and things you believe. And remember that doctors very frequently confuse what they believe with what they know. Wow, that's really powerful. Wow, it's almost like a, a medical version of the of the serenity prayer there, you know, understanding, yes. you know, what we what we can and can't control, right? No, that's really powerful. That's gonna stay with me, Otis. So listen, one of the things you did earlier, which was really sobering, frankly, was give us almost a snapshot of how cancer mortality looked 
at the beginning and then the end of the of the 20th century. So I want to talk a little bit about causes. So in the intro, I mentioned, you know, we have really evidence in the in historic record now that cancer has likely been a problem for our species or at least our antecedents for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. So that tells us that causation is not a modern problem. That's right. What I'm going to ask you next, though, is, is a, a tricky question and one that comes up a lot in clinic when patients say, you know, doc, user Mr. Johnson, for instance, you know, why me? So when you look at cancer's history, as I know you have, Otis, and you know that it has to predate some of our environmental culprits, how do you explain causation to people? And especially if you think it was changing in the 20th century. Sure. You know, I sometimes have said I'm the Forrest Gump of medical oncology because <laughs> I not only know personally Larry Einhorn and Bob Weinberg, but I get to hang out with some really, really smart people who do basic science as well as some really smart people who do clinical medicine. The best way to think of cancer is cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. And all of us have cells that are undergoing growth on a daily basis. And as we get older and our cells get older, those cells are more likely Instead of going through control cell growth, some of them go into uncontrolled cell growth. Now, we have a few things to prevent them from going into uncontrolled cell growth. One is DNA repair mechanisms, and people who have BRCA mutations have a defect in their DNA repair. Then we have on something called P53 on chromosome 17, and that is a mechanism that realizes the cell is going out of control and tries to kill the cell. And, you know, the cell tries to commit suicide. And then the third is our immune system. We have these CD4 cells or T4 cells that are floating around, not just in our bloodstream, but they get into our skin, into our muscle, into our organs. And they're looking for cells that are spinning out of control and they try to kill those cells. This is the immune system. That's normal biology. A cancer escapes that, those three systems and starts undergoing one cell to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16 to 32, so forth. Mitoses, uncontrolled cell growth, uncontrolled mitoses. All right, now, that is normal biology, and that happens in all of us. And the cell that becomes the cancer escapes those three. Now, there are certain carcinogens. The easiest one to understand is probably cigarette smoke or sunlight with skin cancer. They actually interfere with the DNA. And if they interfere with the DNA, luckily at the right part of the DNA, they can actually cause even more uncontrolled cell growth than the natural aging process. And so the natural aging process is why we have a baseline amount of cancer that we just need to accept. And then these other environmental stimuli are why we have three times as many cancers at the end of the 20th century as we did at the beginning of the 20th century. That is such an elegant explanation. And in your self-effacing comments, you said that you're around a lot of smart people. But I have to tell you, Otis, in my opinion, you are definitely one of those people. Well, you're too nice. You're too nice. So, so someone that I have often referred to as the, the poet laureate of oncology, Siddhartha Mukherjee, in one of his books, the way he puts it, and the reason I'm saying it to you is what I, is what I say to my patients, he boils down cancer, oncogenesis, the process of cancer developing into the, the sum of our heredity, so our genetic makeup, environment what he calls triggers. And then finally, and I think this is the trickiest one, chance. And so I think it's the last one that people who really want to believe in the virtues of fitness and healthy eating, and I'm not discrediting any of those things, they have a hard time believing that they can't just outwork what I would call stochastic risk. Like you said, we have all these millions, in fact, billions of cells that are turning over. Mistakes are going to be made and sooner or later, one of those mistakes, as you and I know, may confer a selective advantage, again, on, on a very kind of initially low scale to that cell. Yeah. You know, the analogy that I like to use to, you said, sto stochastic advantage or stochastic. Think of uh, 
we don't even use thumb drives anymore. <laughs> but I used to put my thumb drive into the computer and I would copy a file from my hard drive to my thumb drive. Yes. And if you do that copying enough, you will end up not with an exact copy of the file, but with a corrupted copy. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Now think copying of DNA from one cell to the other over and over again. And occasionally you end up with a corrupted copy of the DNA. And if the DNA is corrupted in the right place, it's in the part of the cell that has the stop signal that says stop mitosis. Then you have your, your cancer. And if your immune system doesn't find that and, and kill it, or your P53, kill it, or your DNA repair, repair that problem, you've got a problem. You've got a cancer. By the way, we can extend that just a little bit further. Most of us are now coming to believe that the reason why people who are obese or pre-diabetic or diabetic are at higher risk of cancer is the pre-diabetic syndrome has hyperinsulinemia in it. And insulin is actually a growth factor for blood vessels. So it's not that prediabetes and diabetes actually causes the cancer. It actually supports the cancer in getting implanted and getting extra blood vessel growth into the tumor so it has oxygen and nutrition so it can grow. You can think of insulin as tumor fertilizer. Yeah, it really it changes the milieu, right? And this to me is always the difference between cancer in a in a petri dish in vitro and cancer in human beings in vivo. It's a completely different and much more complex ecosystem. We've had a wonderful conversation about what science has taught us over the last 50 years. You know, much of what you and I just talked about was not even clearly understood 30 years ago and definitely wasn't known 50 years. Yeah, I know. It's really remarkable. And I can only imagine where we're going, right, in the next, say, half century. It's an exciting time for science. It's so exciting. Yes. And I, I just wish that the, you know, the benefits were immediately available for all of our patients. And we know that they're not. I will say this. It's 2024. I think your thumb drive analogy holds up because American healthcare still runs on the fax machine. So, Otis, I think you're good there for hopefully decades to come. I like it. I'm going to use that in my clinic. So what I wanted to talk to you about now is the dark side of identifying causes of cancer. So this gets into almost the, I think, needless or inappropriate moralization of this disease. Again, using cancer uh, as a, a sort of a more homogenous term. So what I mean by that is it seems to me, and perhaps to you, that certain types of cancer, the phrase is carefully, garner more sympathy. So for instance, when a woman, say, develops breast cancer, mm -hmm. I think that the breast cancer advocacy community is amazing and supportive. But even on like a, you know, kind of more micro level, I, I see patients with breast cancer, they tend to get a lot of support from their communities. What I'm leading up to, and you've already stated this in, in your earlier remarks, is say lung cancer, I think at least in the public consciousness, is so linked to smoking. And you talked about, you know, the carcinogenic effect of tobacco smoke that I wonder if those patients aren't being, how should I put this, penalized? So how do you look at sort of how we've figured out risk factors, but then also how do we how do we make it so we're not demonizing patients for some of these variables that might have gone into how their cancer developed? You are absolutely correct. And the examples to use are lung cancer versus breast cancer. You know, historically, we didn't talk about cancer at all. It was controversial when the American Cancer Society changed its name and put cancer in it in the 1940s. The first celebrity to go on newspapers, TV, so forth, and say, I have cancer, was Shirley Temple, later Shirley Temple Black in the late 1960s, who said, I have breast cancer. When Betty Ford, the wife of the president in 1975, came out and said she had cancer, it was still, oh my God, she said she has cancer, not, oh my God, she has cancer. And actually, it was the mid-1990s when Bob Dole came public with his prostate cancer. And there was a group of guys who started saying, us too. And so we've had a problem talking about cancer, but there is this, oh, I have lung cancer. I did it to myself because I smoked. 
by the way, I disagree with that. I, I blame the tobacco manufacturers, and I've done a great deal of writing about nicotine being addictive, tobacco being spiked with various chemicals yes. to make methyl, especially to make nicotine mm -hmm. even more addictive, to handcuff the patient, efforts to promote tobacco usage. I, I blame those people and not the person who, when they generally, when they were 14, 15, or 16, happened to have taken their first smoke. But it's something that we desperately need to work on. We need to reach out and support every person who is diagnosed with cancer, not just our kids, not just breast cancer patients. We need to think about people with lung cancer, head and neck cancer, colon cancer, all the various cancers. We need to be much more supportive of them. That is so well said. I often say, and again, I'm going to try to echo some of your remarks, you know, no one, no one deserves cancer. And, you know, even I'll maybe get a slightly different response than you did. The fact that non-smokers develop lung cancer means to me, at least, that in a smoker, the cancer is not necessarily directly caused. And now yeah. you and I can maybe quibble about certain subtypes and small cell and what have you. But yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think the tobacco industry at large has a lot to answer for far, far less than individuals who get addicted. Yeah. By the way, uh, one out of five people who develops lung cancer today is a true never smoker. Yes, yes. And I even saw, I think the reason I take this so personally, my late father, I have his picture behind me. You know, he was told inaccurately, actually, that he had lung cancer back in the 1980s. And he was a, a non-smoker. But he immediately started thinking, could he have altered his environment to have less exposure to secondhand smoke? So it was kind of like, you know, two mistakes, A, incorrect terminology, and B, my dad blaming himself for something that was really not his fault. It was all caused by a germline mutation. So as we wrap up, Otis, this has been absolutely wonderful. So we've talked about sort of where we've been necessarily, and obviously that informs where we are. What I want to think about with you at the end here is the future. So we've spent centuries refining our understanding of cancer. What do you think, or where do you think we're going in the future? And, and what, what to you does a world look like where to echo back to sort of the host of this podcast where cancer is conquered. What does that look like? Sure. One of the things I think it was probably my most important study when I was uh, still at the American Cancer Society, I had a wonderful group of epidemiologists. They would do all of these projections, uh, estimates of how many people were diagnosed or how many people died from cancer, published it every January. One of the things they noted was that the disparities among, I hate to give people numbers, but I think I can do this in, in a succinct way. Among college-educated women, the death rate from cancer is 60 per 100,000. Among high school-educated women, the death rate is exactly twice that, 120 per 100,000 per year. When you look at the death rate in Kentucky, it's 195 per 100,000 men and women, the death rate in Utah, it's 125. Yeah. All right. These are the disparities, you know. Yes. When I worked for David Satcher in the 1990s, when we talked about disparities, it was primarily white, black, but I'm now talking Kentucky and West Virginia versus Utah. I'm talking college educated versus non-college educated. And oh, by the way, when you look at the male thing of uh, the male numbers, High school educated men are three times more likely to die from cancer than our college educated men. And giving a college education to a black man is actually more impressive upon his death risk than giving him the rates of white men. Education trumps everything. So what we did was we tried to calculate what is the disparity. Let's quantify the disparity. And so of 600,000 people who die from cancer every year, if everybody had optimal things, the Utah death rate or risk of death or the college educated risk of death, it's about 132,000 of the 600,000 deaths would go away. Some of it because of risk reduction and prevention. There's a lot less alcohol and tobacco use in Utah versus Kentucky. It's true. Some of it because of access to care. 
The death rate, by the way, for Black women from breast cancer in Massachusetts is 18 per 100,000. The death rate per year, the death rate for Black women in Louisiana and Mississippi is 32. Gosh. Okay. Those are the disparities, 18 versus 32. If we just started giving everybody what every human being should get, or at least what college-educated people get or what people in Utah get, we could get rid of 132,000 deaths a year. Some of that is prevention. A large amount of that is appropriate screening, because there is an appropriate screening. And some of that is getting everybody appropriate treatment. Uh, 132,000 out of 600,000 deaths. Now, the 132,000, we were also able to qualify them. 80,000 are white Americans. They live, interestingly, more in the southern, southeastern United States than anywhere else, but they live in every state. And so, uh, you know, when I started my career 35 years ago, uh, health disparities was black, white. Now health disparities is Massachusetts versus Mississippi. And the largest group of people who suffer from health disparities are white Americans. Wow. That's really remarkable. And um, again, the numbers don't lie. And it's really a, a, a striking sort of tapestry that you you paint for us of, of this country. And I'm well aware of these geographic equities. So I feel a little bit guilty now that I, I live and practice in Salt Lake City. But half of my patients, Otis, live in these rural frontier, frontier areas. So I, you know, I do telehealth up to Wyoming and Montana. And you're right. It's like a completely different oncology landscape. And I think there's a, a, a lot of different ways we can bifurcate it, like you said yourself. So I think it's it's both a sobering note, but a hopeful one. I, I heard something similar at one of our research meetings several years ago. I heard, you know, if we just stopped doing research today and we actually applied what we know, just like you said, just the power of equitable cancer care delivery would save so many lives, even without the latest you know breakthrough in progress. So I think that's really a call to action, a call to arms. And I think ultimately it's a very optimistic note uh, on which to end our um, conversation today, Otis. So I have to tell you, you know, oncologist, oncologist, I just find your perspective fascinating. I really appreciate your understanding of history. I appreciate your ability to couch things in numbers and facts. And again, this has been really invaluable for me and I'm sure for our listeners as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Otis. And thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation. Conquer Cancer is creating a world where cancer is prevented or cured and every survivor is healthy. You can make a gift at conquer.org forward slash podcast. The participants of this podcast report no conflicts of interest relevant to this podcast. Full disclosures can be found on the episode page on conquer.org. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.